Hey guys, in this video, let's talk about variational autoencoders. And I'm super excited about this, not only because a lot of you asked for this topic, but also because variational autoencoders itself enables a lot of cool applications. For example, uh, you know, by changing the latent uh, vector, we'll get to that in a minute, by changing these, uh, these latent vectors slightly, you can add a smile to Mona Lisa or a bigger smile to Mona Lisa or add sunglasses to Mona Lisa, right? So uh, it does enable a lot of cool applications. So let's uh, look at what it means in this video, okay? And I try to make it as digestible as possible. And in the next video, let's understand this further by just writing a few lines of code, of course, using Keras and uh, Python and uh, also working on MNIST dataset. So the autoencoder part of variational autoencoder should make sense to you. We covered this in videos number 85 to 90, so nothing new. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on this except uh, a little quick thing. Autoencoder, is as the name suggests, you're encoding something. You're encoding the input data into a smaller space and then decoding it back to get the original data back. Now, what good is that? Yeah, what did we learn here? We learned that, okay, you can take a bigger image, represent that into a smaller uh, space, like smaller latent vector. Let's say this vector is of size uh, five. Okay, you have five numbers completely representing this image and you take those five numbers as input to your decoder, and then you get the original image back, which is pretty cool. I think the a good application is uh, sending a large file over something, assuming the other side already has a decoder. So you just send these vectors from that point on, right? So that, that works very well, but that's not the primary application of autoencoder. We went through a few tricks, like what type of tricks did we go through? Well. Uh, the, one of the applications was, okay, noise reduction. We said, okay, instead of training it only on the image, if I go back again, you're training your X values is your Einstein picture in this case, and your Y is your Einstein picture. You're saying, hey, my input is Einstein, my output is Einstein, just update the weights until you know uh, the reconstruction error is minimal, meaning you're reconstructing Einstein back and as long as the uh, you know, error keeps going down, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead and stop when you think you cannot get any better. So you get there and whatever the latent vector that stays here after the training is your low dimensional representation, right? So this is cool. Now you know your low dimensional representation. So you do exactly the same except you trick this. You say, hey, my input is a noisy image, but then my output is a nice clean image. So you train this and this latent vector and the decoder can be used to actually denoise your input images. So that's one application. The other application is anomaly detection. You have a whole bunch of information going in and you are looking at the reconstruction error and uh, you already trained it on this input data, right? So anything that's above this reconstruction error is an anomaly. This is how you design an anomaly detection detector. And by the way, autoencoder, I'm just showing here encoding and decoding phase, and this can be a regular convolutional networks, or this can be LSTM or anything. So you have LSTM encoder decoder networks, but the, just look at the structure of this, okay? You're encoding that into a latent vector, which is a smaller space, and then you're decoding it back. In this example, we are looking at reconstruction error because that's how you kind of uh, train an autoencoder you know, by uh, using reconstruction error as your loss and you're kind of uh, improving on that. Okay, uh, another example that we did is like domain adaptation. We kind of uh, gave Einstein image as input and Mona Lisa as output and we said, hey, go ahead and train, uh, you know, and we're tricking this again, an autoencoder and again, we have uh, our decoder with the latent vector. So you provide that and it creates, uh, it creates your uh, Mona Lisa picture. Uh, and uh, another example, image colorization, okay? Black and white to color. So this is another example we already looked at. And again, if you haven't, go ahead and check videos 85 to 90 on my uh, uh, channel. Okay, so now let's get back to uh, our autoencoder. What is an autoencoder? You have the encoder part and you have the decoder part, which is basically a generative. It's actually generating stuff as long as we provide a latent vector, right? So let's say my vector is uh, one, two, three, four. I give that vector and then it has the decoder weights already pre-trained. So it's going to create an image or generate data, 
in this example an image so this is this is nothing but a generator and again we covered generative adversarial networks as part of our videos 125 and 126 and in this case g in generative stands for generating once you train it it generates new images this is also pretty cool okay but the point i'm trying to make here is autoencoders or variational autoencoders are not generative adversarial networks because here you have a generator network that's kind of trying to fool the network and you have a discriminator that's trying to catch whoever is fooling it and you're uh, updating these two networks independently well one competing against the other and eventually when uh, uh, you know this is good at fooling and this is not good at being fooled that's when you have uh, uh, it converged and you use that as your generator right so that's completely different discussion but I just want to make sure uh, you understand that that is a uh, you know generative network so when it comes to variational autoencoders we're trying to create a generative network by using that to generate new data. Okay, now how is it any different from uh, autoencoders? Now let's get into that. What does it require for us to generate new data? If you just look at this generative part, what does it require for us to generate this new data? It requires us to provide a vector, right? I mean, if you're not training it, we are just talking about generation part, generative part. So you need whatever that vector is, but how the heck do we know what values are right for that latent vector? Well, this is like, how do we determine those values? So if you look at, uh, uh, for example, if we want to get this sampling, if I train this on a whole bunch of Mona Lisa pictures or Einsteins and Newtons and a whole bunch of these images, and I, I know what the vectors, you know, how uh, uh, should look like, right? I mean, it, I don't, the computer knows what the vectors should look like. So if you just put those latent uh, vector distribution, let's say this is how it looks like. All the values that kind of give us Mona Lisa are up here. All the values that give us Newton are down here. All the values that give us Einstein are here. And all the values that give us uh, Einstein smiling is somewhere else. All the values with uh, Einstein wearing glasses is somewhere else and someone else wearing glasses is somewhere else. Uh, in fact, uh, what if we can bring all of those together, right? So we'll get to that in a second. So this is the latent distribution, but if I know what this vector is, meaning this space where the Newton variables store are stored, uh, or latent vectors are stored, sorry, I should say, then it's fine. But if I just randomly sample, meaning I just give any some random vector, then he, all the values right here mean nothing. So if you just give garbage in, garbage out, that's pretty much it. You'll just get nice, nothing else. So it's not going to create Mona Lisa to us. So in other words, how the heck do we know where Mona Lisa latent vectors are, where Einstein's vectors are? Okay, this is where the variational autoencoders kind of help us. How? Let's look at it. What if we know how to pick these appropriate latent vectors? Okay, this is the key part of variational autoencoders. Okay, now uh, I copied this. I should have uh, put the source down here. I seriously apologize if this image belongs to uh, one of you. I'll probably do that in retrospect later on. Uh, but you see this latent space, and of course we'll generate our own space like this uh, using our own code. Maybe I should have used that code. But this one represents our MNIST data set all the way from zero through nine, right? So these are the digits that are present. And you can see each color. If I pick a latent vector from here, then uh, I'll get a value, I'll get an image that shows nine. If I pick a vector from here, uh, probably that shows me six and so on. So what if we can control how this distribution happens? What if we can constrain this latent vector values to a continuous region? That means as I go from this to there, in terms of changing my vector values. Remember in my original title screen, you see a whole bunch of weird uh, you know, numbers going on. All that's generated by changing the latent vector from here to somewhere else, okay, within a range. That's pretty much it, okay? So what if we can constrain this? This is where, uh, again, VAEs or variational autoencoders come into picture. We'll understand this a little bit more in a second. Uh, uh, maybe the arrow should point somewhere else, like in this gap right here. I just realized that number five is assigned this weird color that I can barely see. Maybe that represents right here. But uh, I, all I'm trying to say here is you see some gaps between these two clusters. 
If you sample from these two gap, from this gap, you'll probably get a uh, noisy image of whatever that, that region represents, okay? As long as you're in this continuous region, you do get a different variation of the same image. Maybe here the, uh, you know, what is this? Nine is slanted here, maybe the nine is straight, but you're vary, varying it. This is where varying the latent vector means you get a varying image. Okay, I hope this part makes sense. So now you know what variational part is, what autoencoder part is, and how it relates to constraining the latent vectors to a predefined uh, space, a continuous region. Now, what do we mean by that? Let's go to one more step. Again, I'm not gonna go into a lot of math or anything here uh, for two reasons. One, I'm not an expert at all of these topics you know, to that level. And two, uh, if you just want to use this and uh, put together your own, then you should be able to do that with this type of information. Okay, now how to define this latent space? Okay, how to define this latent variable space? Well, first of all, instead of mapping input to a fixed latent vector, let me go back, this is very, very important. Instead of mapping this to a fixed latent vector, which means we have to know exactly what it is, what if, let's go back through all the animations, sorry about that, what if you map it to a distribution? What's a distribution? If I say, okay, my distribution is a normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution, then I can say, hey, uh, just predict any number or use any vectors, okay, within this distribution. Meaning, if I tell you this is my boundary, pick any values within this boundary, then it's going to work. Well, values right here are not going to work. Maybe this can be a bit smaller, but hopefully you got the idea. So that's that's the point here. Now, you force these latent variables to be normally distributed, okay? Why? Because it's easy for us to kind of define a normal distribution using mean and the variance, okay? So instead of passing the entire encoder output, okay, what if we use mean and standard de uh, deviation describing this distribution, okay? Now you only have two variables that need to be trained, that's it. Not the entire distribution, okay, which is impossible. So that's one reason. Now, this this is where it gets into some territory if you're not from statistics background that can kind of scare you which is now we are going to quantify the distance between the learned distribution during the training process and the standard normal distribution okay and how do you quantify these two there is something called kl divergence i believe in one of my previous videos we use this as a statistical metric but for now let's just think about okay use a metric kl divergence to quantify this distance Okay, now you have a metric that tells, just like mean squared error, it tells you the difference between the actual line, you know, data point and the predicted line, right, in your linear regression. Now we are going to use uh, KL divergence to kind of quantify the uh, difference between these two distributions, that's it. Because we are not quantifying a uh, data point, but an actual distribution. So when you're comparing two distributions, you can use student t-test and all the other stuff, okay? So we are going to use KL divergence for that fact. I think that should explain even if you have basics in um, statistics. Now, while we are training, we're going to force a normal distribution as close as possible to standard normal distribution by using this scale as a loss function. In other words, the summary of this statement is, this scale divergence is going to be one of the loss functions that we are going to minimize during the training process. I said one of the loss functions because you know what the other loss function is. What is the other loss function for autoencoder? Reconstruction loss. We just saw one of the applications as, uh, you know, uh, anomaly detection where it uses reconstruction loss. So there are two terms. One is KL loss, the other one is reconstruction loss. So we minimize these two. Now coming back, you see, I put I put a digital sunglasses uh, to Mona Lisa, but uh, a variational autoencoder is an autoencoder. This is basically an autoencoder, right? Except instead of a fixed vector, we are going to have a distribution that's defined by a mean and standard deviation or variance if you want to call it sigma squared, right? So a mean and standard deviation. I, ho I hope this makes sense. Instead of using a latent vector, a single vector, okay, as your input to the decoder, we are going to use a distribution so this is how we are constraining the space, okay? A distribution, and you have a mean and standard deviation for that distribution. And from 
there you're going to sample a latent vector and z stands for this vector uh, latent vector space and we're going to sample or a sampled latent vector let me put it that way okay and z is still stochastic meaning it's still uh, uh, it's still random but we are going to pick it using these two parameters that we are going to learn. Well, I think I put another slide that kind of explained this. Uh, yeah, the, the key question here is how to run back propagation. Again, if you're watching this video, you probably know what I'm talking about, right? When we say back propagation, when we are training this network, the weights are updated, okay? Using stochastic gradient descent or some sort of, a, uh, you know, this back propagation algorithm, meaning how do you, how do you run this back propagation or how do you train this if you have a sampling right there if you have a sample latent vector isn't the whole point like not having a fixed vector and just define the distribution using mean and standard deviation yes that is the case and here is the equation that answers your questions hopefully so mu i mean the, our distribution is defined by this right i mean here this is the mean and sigma is the standard deviation we already talked about that to this, we are multiplying epsilon, which is the standard normal distribution. And it's a fixed space for sure, but we are randomly sampl sampling from this fixed space. So we are not training this during the back propagation. So that's okay. So this is the trick, and I think this is called reparameterization uh, re trick, to make this back propagation possible for this type of distributions. Again, let me repeat this. What is going to be trained during the training process is the mean and variance or standard deviation if you want to call this okay mean and standard deviation this epsilon we are randomly picking is sample but it's not learned during back propagation okay so i hope this kind of makes sense let me go back to this previous image before we stop this video and in the next video we are going to uh, we are going to apply this principle Okay, and put together variational autoencoder for MNIST dataset. But the whole, the key point here is we are going to create a constrained space of latent vectors from which we can sample, and it means something. Without that, the we don't know what latent vector to pick, right? That's why autoencoder is not uh, relevant as a uh, or useful as a generator or as a generative model, but variational autoencoders can be very, very useful. So please watch the next video so you learn how to apply this in Keras and Python on MNIST dataset. Please do subscribe. I do this type of cool stuff because you ask for it, okay? Subscribe and encourage me. Thank you very much.